Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way next, Off 90. We take a look behind the music of a Rochester band, the importance of popcorn in Albert Lee, and we revisit a big news story from the past. It's all coming up on your next stop, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this trip, Off 90. The Shift is a Rochester-based band. It doesn't take long to recognize they're talented. Talented musicians, singers, and songwriters. And The Shift has a secret, a story that most people don't know about. It's the story of how two band members, as teenagers, signed a record deal with a major recording label and then went on a national tour. The story is about the ride of a lifetime, experienced by kids and told through the eyes of the now young men who still have big dreams. The Shift is a Rochester, Minnesota band. Travis John Allen, Daniel Allen Johnson, Cole Elbertowski, and Taylor Nogasek. They're talented. You can hear it in their sound. I bet you won't, but I can't dream, oh yeah. And you can see it. But this story began nearly 20 years ago, when Travis and Taylor were 13-year-old boys. This is about the years leading up to the moment they signed a record deal with a major recording label. With the help of the established musician and producer, Bryn Ahrens. Well, I've been playing with string instruments, uh, so like an orchestra, like cello. I played cello for a number of years, and that's kind of where my uh, upbringing was with music. But um, my grandma's attic, my great grandpa's drum set was up there. He played in big bands and swing bands in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. I set it up in, in the basement, started playing ACDC like a pro. I grew up. Like I was, you know, we had guitars in the house. Lead singer and songwriter Travis John Allen's parents were musicians. Plunked around, always watched MTV when I was growing up, played along and stuff, or tried to, obviously, as much as like a four or five year old kid can do. You know, at school there was a assembly in a gymnasium, and Travis was there, and he, and he was whipping out the Star Spangled Banner, uh, like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> So me and Andy, like right afterwards, is like, yeah, this this is this is the guy. This guy is awesome. I'm like, hey, dude, you want to be in a band? He's like, yeah, dude. I kind of went through an awkward phase through like sixth and seventh grade. I was getting into trouble and things like that. And about the time I was 12, I really got into playing guitar. And then I went to sit, you know, in a room for hours. And they asked, and I was like, okay, why not? Travis brought all the skill. <laughs> I mean, Travis was the guy who um, kind of helped us perfect our instruments to a certain degree. Taylor had this beat that he could literally claim as his. He managed to have it right out of the gate with that rhythm. The earliest memory was probably the, the the gigs we had at the CyberQ, which was this small uh, billiards place in town. We'd move all the billiards out of the way, all the pool tables, and we'd pack that place full of stinky, sweaty kids. I mean, we seriously would practice. At first it was a few days a week, and then it started becoming like five days a week. And I remember when we started playing in lacrosse at the warehouse. When you first play on a large stage and you hear stuff bouncing back and you have bass and subwoofers pushing, there was a time where I was just like, oh. Yeah, we're getting good. I was touring the country. Yeah. I mean, I think I had a number 38 hit song at that time as well. Yeah. 
At this time, Bryn Aarons was a singer, guitarist, and producer of a major national band, Flip. Bryn's band had a promotional contest called the Teenage Rampage for high school-aged bands. Travis and Taylor's group, Mr. Completely, entered the contest, and they won. I was pretty excited about that. Oh, I'm going to play at was it the Quest Club, I think, at the time? Yeah. That was huge. I never played on something that big before. Travis's dad reached out to Bryn after the Teenage Rampage, asking if he would produce an album for Mr. Completely. This was at the time when boy bands were kind of a, a new thing. And I remember thinking, you know, there's no Rolling Stones to all these nicey-nicey Beatles bands. There's no villain band. I love guitar playing so much, and Travis is so good. And they had such a thing. Take a look at your son now. Take a look at your son now. I said, okay, if you guys really want to do this, I said, I'm going to just treat this like I'm, like we're making the record, like we have to make it tomorrow. He walked yeah. out of the back room, at or uh, it was Orphan, right? Then yeah. yeah. He was yeah. like, I'm going to be called the f*** ups. And we were, I remember just being like, okay. <laughs> and what do you say to that? I mean, that's shocking. We first went in and cut a few songs, two or three. Well, they came out so well that Joel Allen, Travis's dad, said, do you think you could do anything with these? I said, well, I tell you what, buy me a plane ticket to L.A. and I'll just see. You know, I'll knock on doors of people I know. Well, it was a Tuesday morning. I flew into L.A. I landed at 10 o'clock in the morning. I called my friend who was the head of A&R at Capitol Records at the time. I said, hey, I'm in town. Wondering if you want to have a cup of coffee. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I got a little bit of time before my A&R meeting. He goes, well, what are you in town for? And I said, well, I produced this band called the F*** Ups. He goes, well, give me a copy. He goes, I got to go into my A&R meeting. He goes, but you want to do lunch afterwards? So I said, sure. And my phone rings 20 minutes later. And he offered me $15,000 right then and there to not take it anywhere else. I got the band, one of the... Minnesota's larger record deals in 20 minutes. With a signed record deal with Capitol Records in hand, the group of now 17-year-olds needed to get to work recording their first album. By the time we, we went into the recording studio, we were pretty focused, we were ready to do this. Working with Bren, he molded us into this machine. We stayed in the cities, we stayed at American about 10 miles outside of town. We just all crammed into this little room, get there at eight in the morning and be there till like 12 to one o'clock in the morning sometimes. And we had to go to Sound City Studios in LA to finish up some vocals. Now Sound, look it up, Sound City Studios, you're talking the greatest albums in the world were made at this place. I remember the engineer was like, Janis Joplin sang in there. And I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> Fleetwood Mac Rumors. You can go your own way. Go your own way. And then we worked at AM. This is where We Are the World was done. What kid at this age gets to do something like this? Yeah. The value of that experience is something I'll never forget. It felt awesome to be done, but like, it was a process. The band went on a three-month national tour in cities all across America and in Canada. We loaded up a van and we just took off. Couldn't even tell you where we went the first time. The highs are high and the lows are low. You gonna rip it up, Chris? Oh, we'll rip it up. We'll move across the stage. The I grew up in three months on the road, and I'm glad I had that experience because yeah. it made me the person I am today. I'm definitely thankful for it. After two years, the record label did not renew the band's contract. It left the group disappointed, but with a skill set and experiences that will last a lifetime, as well as a major studio album to their credit. Without their age, it wouldn't have happened. I don't think you could take a single element away from it. 
and still have what you got with it. Which to me is probably one of the greatest melodic punk rock records to come out from that era. More than 15 years after signing their deal with Capitol Records, Travis and Taylor's new band, The Shift, is working on their second album. You can find them performing in and around Rochester and throughout the Midwest. You can find their first album on iTunes. Music hasn't really changed much for me. It's all I know. I mean, like right now I'm a barista. Yeah, we toured, we were on a major label, but I work at a Starbucks now, you know what I mean? Um, it's all I want to do. It's all I've known. I mean, maybe nothing will happen with it. Maybe it will, but I just, I don't know. I, it's always going to be a part of my life. I will never give that up. For me, it's practicing. It's um, actually playing the music. That means a lot to me. You know, some people, you know, riding a motorcycle or going snowmobiling or going fishing means a lot to them. But for me, it's to play music with the people I enjoy playing it with. It's part of my soul. It makes me forget life. You know what I mean? It just takes away things. People it's meditate. Like it's my form of that. Your healing power. Yeah, that's that's what gets me through. Children have been vaccinated for polio since the mid-50s. Before then, there were thousands and thousands of people afflicted with polio. Merrill Nelson from Albert Lee was one of those people. Merrill had been a farmer, but by 1956, farming had become too difficult for him. So, Merrill opened a popcorn stand. Even though Merrill passed away in 1983, Merrill's popcorn stand still remains to cater to its many happy customers. He really, really was an Albert Lee gem. I mean, he was iconic in Albert Lee, and, and he was in a wheelchair. I had popcorn for breakfast. <laughs> what else? <laughs> what else? I have it every morning here. It's my daily diet. Thank you, ma'am. You have fun. See you later. See you later. My grandpa got polio when polio was going around back in the day. He was paralyzed from the waist down and he farmed for five years. My grandmother would carry him out on the tractor, but it got to be too much with the cows, the chickens, all that kind of stuff, and she had three small children, plus my great-grandmother, to take care of it. It was just too much. I think they started the popcorn stand in 1956. Um, they left the farm, they moved to Albert Lee. He um, opened up the popcorn stand in an old camper. It was a round camper. He was parked right next to Walgreens for years. Then he moved to Clark Street, Clark and Broadway. Right now it's the Visitor's Bureau. They opened it up to the Visitor's Bureau. Um, but it used to be just a little popcorn stand that he could roll in and he would have a little sliding glass door that he would have a, sell a popcorn out of. Merrill was my grandfather. We called him Grandpa Merrill. And oftentimes when the subject of Merrill's popcorn came up, it was always such a proud moment for me to say, hey, that's my grandpa. I'm so grateful that my grandpa allowed his grandchildren to take turns and to work each summer at the county fair at his popcorn stand. It was a great learning experience for us. It taught us how to interact with people, how to make change. Also gave us some extra spending money for the new school year, so it was a wonderful learning experience for us. Well, I came to Albert Lee in 1973, and I worked just a couple of doors down. 
I just have so many fond memories of being in that area with him. We would sit there and we would have this great view and he would tell me stories or who had passed by. He was just the gentlest, kindest, just the nicest man. I'm so glad way back then in the early 70s that I really got to know him and spend time with him. Many, many times the high school, because it was just down the street from here, high school kids would come by and they would look at him and they would want to buy popcorn, but sometimes they didn't have quite enough money. He really trusted those students that came by because he would give them boxes of popcorn and often I heard him say, you can just pay me whenever you can. So he trusted the students and the students trusted him. Well, I had a guy here a couple years, was it last year, I think, that laid a dime on my counter and I was like, well, what is that for? He goes, I owed it to your grandpa because I never got to pay him. So um, that was his dime for his popcorn that he gave the kid, you know. And I give away popcorn all the time too. It's kind of a tradition. We're not gonna let somebody go hungry without their popcorn. <laughs> Grandpa was a great listener. Kids would come up to him and they would sit in the popcorn stand and tell all their problems. And they said that he was kind of like their savior. He, he would advise them. He wouldn't tell them what to do, but he would just talk to them and listen to them. And, and they said it made a world of difference. I have a lot of friends that come and talk to me. I'm trying to do what Grandpa did. I don't know if I'm any good at it. He was the best. I'm actually from Clark's Grove, and I would walk down the, the street, and I would always see Merle down there. So I knew him. So when I came here to buy his popcorn, he would always say, oh, you're my Clark's Grove girl. And I would go, yes, Merle, I'm your Clark's Grove girl. And then he would always take his box, and he would put half the popcorn in there, then he would put a whole bunch of butter, and then he would uh, finish off the top, and we would get some more butter. Merle's Popcorn Stand, the best place to go. Had the best popcorn ever. The caramel corn was out of this world. He always had a smile on his face, always had a joke or other story to tell us. He was just the most friendliest guy, and we, he's missed, that's for sure. In the summer of 1995, students from Lesur, Minnesota found large numbers of deformed frogs in a wetland near the Minnesota River. By 1996, there were reports of deformed frogs in other parts of the country too, generating widespread concern among scientists, health officials, and state and federal agencies. Judy Helgen was an investigator of this phenomenon from the beginning. She wrote a book about her experience called Peril in the Ponds. such a horrible thing to happen to any creature and, and it was so awful in so many ways. It is one of nature's simple creatures, but in Minnesota's famed waters, a mysterious disease is deforming and killing hundreds of thousands of frogs. We certainly were concerned about human, human health issues also, so we really wanted to look at every aspect of, of the environment of the frog. It took over my life. Judy Helgen of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is here to tell us more. Uh, Dr. Helgen, you've had 14 test sites uh, in Minnesota and you've discovered it's definitely in the water. Well, I'm Judy Helgen. I'm a retired research scientist from Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I wrote a book called Peril in the Ponds and that is telling this story. My colleague and I at Pollution Control were doing biological evaluations of wetlands. In 1995, Cindy Reinitz at the charter school brought kids out here in August to do a nature walk. And they started picking up these deformed frogs. And at first they just thought they were injuries, but they found so many. And she wanted to call somebody in the state to come and help, and so she called me. 
Last September, we reported that deformed frogs were turning up in Lesura County. Uh, Once it went into the news media here, I was getting calls from all over the state, and, and then it became national. I mean, there were 40, what, 45 states. Scientists are scratching their heads over something that's been found in the waters of Minnesota, frogs born with deformities. Even by the late 90s, it had deformed frogs in them, and international. I mean, what was happening in the 1990s was new. And, and it wasn't just this pond. It was much broader in impact. So that's what made it even more and more serious. Every day, little creatures suddenly start becoming freaks, and then the hero or the heroine has to find out what's happening before humans begin to suffer. The most sensational frogs that went all over the world in the pictures are the ones with the extra legs. But it turns out that most of them had missing limbs or part Part of a limb, part of a, you know, the foot was gone uh, or the total limb was gone. And that was like 60% of the kind of deformities found here, but also nationally. It was on everybody's mind. And that's why we ended up partnering with oh, Minnesota Health Department and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. It was one of our big partners because they, they always, they con their concern really was are things that are going wrong in the environment also a problem for humans, potentially? And they were great partners for us. Well, we had a contract with a lab that did a test with, uh, developed with very early stage tadpoles, and they were finding a lot of deformities uh, from Minnesota sites that had deformed frogs in them. And they also discovered, th thank goodness, because uh, they discovered that if they passed the pond water through an activated charcoal filter, it removed the activity that would cause deformities in the lab embryos. They happened to sample people's wells, and the wells happened to cause deformities in the lab test. Now, the guy from the national lab called me at night one time to say, you know, the, <laughs> the well water caused deformities, and we immediately got the people activated charcoal filters because right at that time they also found out that the charcoal filtration would, would get rid of the cause, whatever it was. They, they concluded that something was in the water and it wasn't, you know, it was chemical. It's a biological mystery that's been puzzling scientists here in Minnesota and around the country for years. One of our managers came into a meeting and slammed his stuff down and said, how did we ever get involved with deformed frogs? Because we had so much media attention and we had controversy. And, you know, we had to do press conferences and, you know, there were, there were things that were happening where some people didn't want us looking at chemical pollution, for instance. And so there were a lot of cross currents. And besides, the whole biological monitoring idea was, was tenuous there in the early, in the mid-90s. Um, I think now, as I said, it's a very well-established program at, peace, at the Pollution Control Agency. But there was a feeling that DNR should be doing this, and we were feeling, no, this is potentially a pollution problem. We should be doing it. But there were times when we were almost lost our jobs. <laughs> I'll say. You had to believe in what you were doing, no matter what. I finally had to say, we can't do interviews, because it was taking over the total job. I mean, you know, Nightline and CBS News and the Lair Pro. I mean, I, I was glad to do it, but at the same time, you know, all of a sudden a truck rolls up and someone says, well, CBS News is down in the parking lot and they want to talk, you know. And I, at that point, I said, you know, we really have to draw the line and do our work. But it, be, it was good because it put the story out to everybody. I think everybody was kind of worn out trying to figure this out and without coming up with answers. And the Pollution Control Agency just shut it down and I think it was 2002. The problem hasn't gone away, but nobody's looking. Well, you, you have to be passionate about what you do. You have to get out and look. Because if we're not looking at the frogs, we don't know if they still have a problem. And that's sort of the bigger picture is if we're not looking at the health of the environment, we don't know if it's healthy. And so I think that's the big story to me, that you have to go out and look.
We're near the end of this tour off 90. Thanks for riding along. See you next time. But before we go, here's a short story about Adam's Bookstore in Rochester. In 1883, M.G. Spring opened a bookstore that would become a fixture in Rochester as Adams Bookstore. In 1901, after passing through several owners, Henry Adams purchased the store located in the Massey Building. In addition to books, items for sale included games, gifts, stationery, and fountain pens. One notable patron was Helen Amelia Thompson Sunday wife of revivalist Billy Sunday. She was photographed perusing books during her stay at the Cook Hotel in 1906. In August 1917, the Rochester Daily Post and Record reported a rare book at the store, published way back in 1713. The book is difficult to read. It is interesting, however. Photographs show hordes of people looking into the store's windows, eager to have a look at the old book. After Adam's death in 1937, his daughter Mildred managed the store until 1965, when she sold it to Farnham's Stationery of Minneapolis. Unfortunately, the store closed in 1967. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.